Hi everyone! Welcome back to Philosophy of Cognitive Science with me, Dr. Josh Redstone. Today's lecture is entitled Meet Machines Mindware as Software Part 2. And of course, this is a continuation from Tuesday's lecture where I gave a brief overview of the uh, sketches of the history of cognitive science from Clark's book Mindware, uh, particularly the first chapter. Today, we'll be covering the discussion section of that chapter. So before we get into things, let's do a quick recap and set the agenda for today's lecture. All right, so if you recall Tuesday's lecture, we actually began at the end of the chapter with Terry Bisson's They're Made Out of Meat. I directed you to watch a short film adaptation of They're Made Out of Meat, which I will again make available in the video description for this video. But that's where we started, and I wanted you to keep this running analogy, uh, this meat machine, meat machine being the way Marvin Minsky describes the human mind-brain, uh, in mind as we cover all of this material, and indeed as we proceed throughout the book. So that's where we began. We also talked about, uh, with respect to the historical considerations that Clark discusses here, we talked a lot about developments in formal logics and the power of formal systems to um, respect semantic properties, even though they are blind to semantic properties and operate only on syntactic properties. We talked a lot about Turing machines, another important development in the history of cognitive science. Of course, we also spent a little bit of time talking about substance dualism, uh, namely the variety we get from a thinker like Rene Descartes, uh, where we have um, non-physical mental substance and extended physical substance. And we also talked a great deal about computationalism and functionalism. And we'll be talking a lot about this stuff today as well as we cover the rest of chapter one. Today, of course, we're going to be exclusively focused on section 1.2, uh, from Clark's book. We're going to consider these four points of discussion that Clark lays out. You know, after having sketched, um, sketched out functionalism and computationalism and important developments in formal logic and computer science and philosophy that kind of gave birth to cognitive science, uh, he then says, let's stop and question these things. Let's start to worry about them. That's what we'll be doing today. Discussing critically analyzing, maybe worry a little bit about whether we're uh, perhaps being a bit too materialist or too physicalist. So, what are these points of discussion? Well, the first point of discussion is the question, why treat thought as computation? Last time, of course, we talked a lot about how powerful this mind as computer, you know, this meat machine analogy is, but now we'll come back and look at it with a bit more of a critical eye. The second point of discussion is a question that reads, is software on autonomous level in nature? This sounds a bit abstract here, but you'll see what I mean as we get into it. We're also going to be talking uh, about the differences between mimicking and modeling versus, say, realizing or implementing different types of behaviors. In this case, intelligent behaviors, because of course we're talking about intelligent machines, be they meat machines or digital computers. Does a digital computer that, um, say, does a bit of natural language processing that you could carry on a conversation with, is that merely mimicking human intelligence or is that a legitimate form of intelligence? That's a question we're going to touch on a little bit today as well. Finally, at the end, we're going to discuss consciousness, information, and pizza. The reason we're going to talk about all of this stuff is because we we haven't really touched on this question yet, the question that Clark is going to touch on during this point of discussion. And that question is, what kind of phenomenon is consciousness? Is consciousness an informational phenomenon, or is it an altogether different type of phenomenon? We'll discuss that when we come to this last point of discussion from chapter one in Clark's book. All right, so before we dive into these points of discussion, I just want to cover some important things from box 1.5 from chapter 1, which deals with this question, what is computation? Now, of course, during the last lecture, I characterized computation as a kind of rule-governed information processing. And usually, uh, at least at this stage of our discussion, when we're talking about the prehistory or early history of cognitive science, 
Uh, by information processing, we mean the transformation of uh, some group of symbols into another group of symbols. And of course, the symbols represent information. Now, this is, this is all true. This is how we typically characterize computation, but it doesn't quite get us to what is really important, to the core um, of what should really concern us in this discussion about computationalism. So, um, before we can answer this question, what is computation, we need to go a little bit deeper. So that's what we're going to do now. I'm going to read a quote from Churchland and Sinyowski, who write, we count something as a computer because, and only when, its inputs and outputs can be usefully and systematically interpreted as representing the ordered pairs of some function that interests us. So on a close reading of that, you can see that that's kind of along the lines of what I was telling you in our previous lecture, right? We have inputs and outputs that can be usefully and systematically ter interpreted because they represent some function that's interested to, interesting to us, I should say. I suppose this is a bit like when I mentioned that, um, you know, these systems work and preserve meaning and truth and respect reason despite being blind to semantic properties? Well, that's because the human designers put the properties there. We're the ones that assign the meaning to the symbols. And so here it seems like computation is, or computational systems are something that are designed. At least they are in, um, in the case of, you know, the ones we build. I mean, just go back to the example of the pocket calculator, right? I mean, um, the outputs of a pocket calculator uh, can be usefully and systematically interpreted, and um, we understand that the inputs and outputs are an ordered pair, and that the, this computing machine um, computes the function uh, that these ordered pairs are a part of. So if my inputs are, are, inputs are 2 and 2, and my function is addition and my output is 4, I can understand that. That's great. That's computation. And the physical states of the machine uh, map onto the uh, computational states of this arithmetic function, right? And that's great, uh, but it kind of overlooks something. I guess the problem here that Clark is drawing attention to is that this is pretty interpretive, right? And it depends on there being a human programmer. But obviously there is no human programmer of the meat machine in your skulls. So maybe we need something a little bit more robust and objective here. So David Chalmers has a similar idea. He thinks that something is computational if and only if, quote, the causal structure of the system mirrors the formal structure of the computation. So again, in the case of the pocket calculator, the causal structure is the physical structure of the device, and the formal structure is the form of the actual computation, the transformation of some symbols into other symbols, of 2 plus 2 added together into 4, right? The important thing to emphasize here is that this need not happen by design, or at least not intelligent design, right? Not in the sense that a calculator is, ident is intelligently designed by a human designer. I think of the human brain, which faced... Uh, certain evolutionary pressures during the evolution of our species. Uh, certain kinds of computations may have been selected for. Computations to do with predator detection and avoidance or mate selection. Um, all kinds of things like that. Granted, those are simpler examples. More complicated examples might have to do with the kinds of uh, cognition, like uh, cultural cognition, and so on and so forth, but I don't want to get into that too deeply right now. So this is to say um, that the brain is not designed in the sense that the pocket calculator is, of course, right? The brain is designed by natural selection, not by a designer. Now, the important thing for Chalmers is that while all things will satisfy some computational description, in the sense that the causal structure of the system we're talking about will map on to some kind of formal structure, formal computational structure. Um, uh, what is important is that certain things implement a specific computational description. So we're interested in the specific 
kind of computational stuff that our brains do, for example, right? And this key notion, this notion of implementation, is very important for our, uh, for our discussion in what will follow. This idea of implementation is the idea that um, physical systems that we call computers, their causal structure uh, coincides with or corresponds with or mirrors the formal structure of a computation, right? So when we implement something computational, we're implementing that formal structure whoops, in such a way that whatever we're implementing in, that whatever we're implementing it in, I should say, that computer's behavior will mirror the uh, structure of the formal system. You see what I mean? If not, let me know in the comments section. I'll try to clarify things if I can for you. So I guess to try and summarize what I just said a little bit more succinctly, we could say that computation is indeed the rule-governed transformation of symbols into other symbols. It is rule-governed information processing. But what's important to keep in mind is that computational systems are physical systems which implement computations. Computations occur in this kind of formal domain in a formal system, and that system will be implemented or realized, as I often sometimes say, in a physical system. So that's computation. Now we can move on to point of discussion A, and that is why treat thought as computation? Well, as we've seen, we are physical systems, right? Our mind brain is a meat machine. Uh, it's a kind of natural computer. So in a certain powerful way, it's not all that dissimilar from a calculator. Although in important ways, it is dissimilar from a calculator as well. So thinkers are physical systems and we display reason respecting behavior, right? Our behaviors, our computational behaviors, the behavior of the meat machines in our brains, in our heads, tends to preserve reason and respect truth. But that is not to say that we are merely automatons. Rather, we don't seem to be merely automatons. I don't seem to be an automaton at any rate, and I'm sure that you don't think you're an automaton either. Instead, thinkers are guided by reasons, by beliefs, by desires, by feelings, by ideas, and so on and so forth. We generally appeal to these kinds of things when we try to explain and make sense of our own behavior, and when we try to make sense of the behavior of other people as well. Now, without getting too far ahead of ourselves, the thing to pay attention to here is um, how physicalist do we really want to go? We saw hints of this worry last time in our previous lecture, right? We want to dispel the mysteries and uh, f magical flim-flam of dualism, right? Um, this, this idea that there is physical stuff and mental stuff raises more problems than it solves. The big problem being the mind-body interaction problem. But we don't want to go strictly physical necessarily either, right? We want to leave some room for functional descriptions of the systems we're talking about. Right? Uh, this was the problem that Putnam had with identity theory that I talked about towards the end of our previous lecture. So you can imagine a scenario like that put forward by Zenon Polition, a cognitive scientist who has worked closely with other figures who we'll talk about today, like Jerry Fodor. Polition uh, has this scenario he asks us to imagine of witnessing an accident and uh, realizing that um, somebody may need help and uh, forming that belief that someone needs help and a desire to help them and subsequent beliefs that you can reach help by going to a payphone or probably, probably your cell phone nowadays and dialing 911 because you believe if you do that an ambulance will come and you know this chain of beliefs and desires is what causes you to behave a certain way and what explains your behavior as well. Indeed, we don't tend to explain the behavior of uh, thinking beings in these kinds of situations, or indeed in any situation, uh, in, any, in any number of situations, just by appealing to physical states in the brain. 
That would be kind of weird. Instead, we talk about people's beliefs and desires. We don't talk about the sound waves from someone's utterance of the word help reaching my ear and causing my tympanic membrane to move and causing my auditory nerves to fire, causing nerves in my auditory cortex to fire. And these interact with other uh, groups of neurons in such a, such a way, producing motor responses that cause me to run to the phone and dial 911. I mean, sure, we could do that, but that seems to leave something important out of the picture. And that is what actually seems to guide our behavior our reasons, our desires, our ideas, our motivations, our mental states, if you will. I guess a good way of putting this is that what is key in explaining behavior, whether it's the behavior of somebody who witnesses an accident and decides to call for help, or um, the behavior of somebody just uh, getting up and going to the fridge to get a drink because they're thirsty, what's important here are the reason-guided aspects of our behavior, not the raw physical states of the brain and the nervous system. What's important here is, for example, wanting to get help for a person who's had an accident, or wanting to get a beverage from the refrigerator, uh, not, uh, not whether uh, somebody's C fibers are firing because they've been in an accident, or whether somebody's uh, hungry and, and feels like they need a, a snack from the fridge because their blood sugar levels have dropped. And you may have noticed there is a kind of dualism, I suppose, kind of sneaking back in here, but it's not a substance dualism. Uh, it's maybe a kind of methodological dualism, right? Here we're not interested in two different substances like mind and matter. Instead, what we're interested in is matter, a substance, and some of its properties, its reason-respecting properties, or the reason-respecting behavior of systems that are made out of matter. Jerry Fodor, again, a longtime collaborator with Zenon Polition, had a similar argument that he offered. He thought the trains of thought, you know, trains of thought such as, it's raining, so I'll go inside, um, are content-determined. This is to say that the transition between these different computational states or cognitive states or mental states or whatever you want to call them um, are determined by the content of those states. So let me try and break that down for you right now. So Fodor um, very famously argued that in the mind there are symbol structures, that is symbols or combinations of symbols that represent information. Here they might represent states of affairs like it is raining, and uh, perhaps in a context where it is raining, they would guide and generate behaviors like um, going inside, or uh, even prior to behaviors, they generate beliefs and desires. The belief that it is raining, because you see water droplets falling from the sky and you're beginning to get all wet, um, and you form the desire to go inside where it will not be raining. Fodor actually de dedicated um, entire books to this idea, which he called the language of thought hypothesis. He, of course, argued that uh, in the mind, or rather, our mind is a symbol system. We don't have a symbol system in our mind. Our minds are symbol systems. The symbol system uh, in question is what he called the language of thought. It's a formal language, not a natural language. So that means it's more like a logical language like um, propositional logic or the predicate calculus. It's not a natural language like English. The symbols in the language of thought can have content. They can be about things. And there are rules represented with other symbol structures in this system as well. Rules that govern the transformation of symbols into other symbols. The legal moves in the game of thought, if you like. So this is what Fodor means when he says that uh, transitions between you know, thoughts like, it's raining to, I'll go indoors, are content determined. Um, and if Fodor's right, if, that, if he's right that the mind works this way, then of course the mind is a computer exactly uh, in the sense that Clark describes computers in this book, in Mindware. So why treat thought as computation? Well, it works. As Clark says, 
Reason-guided action, it seems, makes good scientific sense if we imagine a neural economy organized as a syntax-driven engine that tracks the shape of semantic space. So like Chalmers said, a computational process is something that implements um, a computation, mirrors the formal transformations of the computation in the physical structure of the system. And our minds, according to Fodor, work like this as well, because they are symbolic information processors. We think using this kind of language or th language of thought, or mentalese, as it's sometimes called, a formal language that, it's a, that, that is a bit like a logical language. It tracks the shape of the semantic space, even though it seems to be blind to the semantics, which may sound a bit weird, considering that you probably don't have the sense uh, that you don't know uh, the contents of your own mind, uh, but bear with me. So, why treat thought as computation? Well, it, as I said a moment ago, it works. And although some of the claims that are going on here might seem a little counterintuitive or even a little disturbing, disturbing in the same way that the meat machine analogy might be a little bit disturbing or alien. It is very powerful, and we are just scratching the surface here. Again, let me remind you. So, if any of this is unclear or a little counterintuitive, I hope that it will become clearer as we proceed through this class. But in any case, that's all I'm going to say about point of discussion A. Now we'll turn to point of discussion B. Is software an autonomous level in nature? So, um, this mindware as software analogy that Clark is using is powerful, but as he points out, it can also be a little bit misleading. <clears throat> it's misleading in the sense that it promotes this crisp level distinction between algorithms and hardware, right? And it's not clear that such a distinction even exists in nature or whether we are putting this distinction there uh, ourselves. I guess a better way to put this is that um, human computer scientists and artificial intelligence specialists and, you know, people like this make a theoretical distinction between hardware and software, hardware and algorithmic level stuff. Uh, David Marr did this, the famous neuroscientist, and we will talk more about his work uh, in this area in future classes. But suffice to say, for now, Marr distinguished between certain levels of analysis, like uh, the implementational level, which is all about the hardware, and the algorithmic level, which is about the information processing steps. That's great for computers, but it's unlikely that nature has built such a distinction into natural computational systems. What this means is that um, we should expect to find biological computational strategies, you know, m different kinds of mindware out there in the world, in, in, in people's minds, in, in non-humans, animals' minds, so on and so forth. We should find computational strategies in these places that achieve fast results, at least fast enough for the purposes of surviving and propagating your genes, using slow, imprecise wetware. This, of course, means that we need to pay close attention to the biological details here. We can't ignore the brain, as cognitive scientists did, um, well, up until the 1980s, when the neuroimaging technology was finally good enough for us to take a, a look at what goes on, information processing-wise, in the brain. So paying attention to biological details will help us to identify what kinds of computational strategies have evolved in different kinds of brains. And it'll also help us to identify any constraints there might be on those computational strategies. And these strategies have to do with all kinds of different things, like, again, mate selection, predator detection, finding food, uh, so on and so forth. Clark also points out that the mindware as software claim is merely schematic. It's an analogy that's meant to um, promote physicalism or convey physicalism and deny dualism. It is a quote-unquote bare explanatory schema, according to Clark. 
This means that the mindware as software's uh, explanatory range includes computational systems other than digital computers, computational systems that might not be that similar to uh, digital computers in their makeup or in the way that they perform computations. So we can say mindware is software, but we need to keep in mind that our mindware, the software of the brain, may not be like the software of a computer in any strong sense of the word, other than that the mindware is in the wetware, just like the um, software of a computer is in the hardware of the computer, if that makes sense. After all, this analogy covers more than just digital computers. It covers analog computers. It covers connectionist networks. It, co it covers a lot of different kinds of physical implementations or cognitive architectures, if you like. Those are two different things, by the way, that I'll explain in more detail in future lectures. To make matters more complicated, we can even tell different computational stories of the same device depending upon what questions we're trying to answer or what level of analysis we've chosen to study that device. So, for example, a cognitive psychologist or a cognitive scientist is going to offer different computational descriptions of the same thing, the mind brain, mindware, that a neuroscientist would. For example, um, a psychologist might talk about belief desire psychology, or more likely a philosopher of mind is going to talk about belief desire psychology, really. Um, and this is very high level computational stuff. But a neuroscientist is going to talk about functional descriptions of different neural circuits, and they're going to pay much more attention to the physical details, the implementational details, than the computational or the algorithmic details, right? So the same thing, the mind-brain, um, can have different uh, information processing stories told about it, depending on what level of analysis we're taking and what research questions we're trying to answer. So the mindware as software analogy is appealing, but we need to remember a couple of things. The first is, don't let's start thinking that there is only one uh, level of computational or neural organization that's named by this term mindware. There are probably multiple levels of organization. Indeed, there are multiple levels of neural organization in the human brain. And secondly, don't think that mindware as software warrants us to ignore the biological details of the hardware slash wetware. So those are two things that we need to keep in mind. This mindware uh, uh, as software analogy does not mean there is a crisp distinction between the software and hardware or mindware and wetware level out there in natural uh, computational systems like the human brain or non-human animal brains. All right, so now we come to point of discussion C, mimicking, modeling, and behavior. And this is probably, to me at any rate, the most interesting point of discussion here in this chapter. So let's get into it. So there are myriad examples in the history of artificial intelligence uh, of computational systems that seem to model or approximate human thought and behavior in some sense. One of the early examples that's really interesting is the first chatbot, which was named Eliza and was created by Joseph Weizenbaum at MIT. Weizenbaum uh, designed Eliza to mimic the behavior of a uh, Rogerian psychotherapist, that is a humanist psychotherapist in the tradition of uh, Carl Rogers. So, um, Eliza was apparently able to fool real people who would talk to it via uh, like a teletype display that it was a real person, notably Weizenbaum's secretary. Perry was another interesting early example. Perry was a computer program that would mimic the linguistic behavior of a person with paranoid schizophrenia. So an interesting take on the chatbot where Eliza was a psychotherapist, Perry was a patient. A few more modern examples are Alice and Jabberwocky, uh, based, I suppose, on the uh, eponymous characters from Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland. 
I've included here uh, a link of a transcript in the video description and on your slides on slide 10. Uh, it's a transcript of a conversation between Alice and Jabberwacky, and it's actually quite humorous. It went viral a few years ago, so perhaps you've read it already, but if not, I highly recommend you take a look. Even if you have read it, go ahead and refresh your memory by clicking the link below in the description. Of course, there are other very famous examples uh, as well that go beyond linguistic behavior, or rather do something different than uh, try to model human linguistic behavior. There's IBM's Deep Blue. I remember when I was young, uh, the big news in the, uh, well, it was the mid-90s, 1996, showing my age here, back in elementary school, when I heard the news that Gary Kasparov, who was the uh, highest rated chess player at the time, who had the highest ELO rating at the time, was defeated by Deep Blue in a series of chess matches. And of course, in 2011, IBM's other famous computer, Watson, beat two of the uh, big uh, Jeopardy champions of the day. I think it was Ken Jennings, and um, I can't remember the name of the other person, but uh, Watson... Uh, won this Jeopardy tournament and took home the prize. And of course, the prize was donated to charity because Watson's not a person. But it was very impressive to see this uh, machine play Jeopardy and beat these two human champions at Jeopardy. Now, as Clark points out, computer programs often seem like, quote, shallow and brittle simulacrums of the kind of understanding that humans and other animals manage to display. Does that apply to these examples? And if so, are these just the initial hiccups uh, as we try and build intelligent machines? Or are they indicative of a fundamental problem with our understanding of intelligence and more broadly with AI and computer science in general? Well, if we're going to tackle questions like this, we need to remember that there are certain questions that we have to keep separate. So we need to make sure to distinguish between questions like, are these computer programs good models of human intelligence? And questions like, are these programs displaying real, albeit non-human forms of intelligence? So is a program like ELISA a good model of human intelligence, or is it a bad model, yet still intelligent in its own way? Clark actually says that um, all of the examples that I've given here fail uh, on both counts. Uh, they fail uh, to give an affirmative answer to both of these questions, and I agree with him. Eliza, Perry, Alice, and Jabberwacky all make use of canned responses. They use things like heuristic search um, to respond faster. Um, they're not altogether very complicated, and although they're clearly computational, they probably don't generate their responses the same way that my brain generates verbal responses to things that people say to me. Moreover, and I cannot emphasize this enough, none of these programs understand what they're hearing or reading or saying in the same way that people do. Similarly, IBM's Deep Blue relies on different kinds of search, brute force search, heuristic search, very different uh, computationally than what a human chess player does. A chess player like Gary Kasparov actually uh, relies a lot on intuition and past experience. Deep Blue can see many more moves ahead than a player like Gary Kasparov can. But really, the tournament between Kasparov and Deep Blue was quite close. Um, it wasn't as if Kasparov lost every game. It was a close game, or rather a close tournament. But the point is, Deep Blue doesn't understand anything about chess the way that Gary Kasparov does. And likewise, IBM's Watson doesn't understand anything in the questions that it's providing answers to. Or it's Jeopardy, so I guess I should say in the answers it's providing 
questions to. So computer programs like these, whether we're talking about Eliza or Perry or Deep Blue or Watson, do not seem to display faithful models of human psychology. They are impressive, but they don't compute the same way that we seem to compute. Okay, so maybe they think in their own non-human way. But the simplicity of the computations that are actually involved makes some people uneasy to grant this. After all, uh, you know, examples like Eliza seem very compelling and interesting when they're first introduced. When Eliza was introduced in the 1960s, it fooled certain people into thinking that they were talking to a machine. It passed the Turing test, if you like. But uh, now, Elisa, to all of us, um, and the level of ex with our level of exposure to the level of technology that we possess, Elisa does not seem all that impressive, and we can easily see that it's not that intelligent. And when we learn how Elisa works using uh, simple search procedures and canned responses and uh, reforming uh, sentences that it's just read. Um, we can see that it's not all that complex, so we're hesitant to grant that Elisa thinks. Perhaps Watson still seems impressive to you, but in 50 years' time, Watson will seem so simple compared to whatever AI we've come up with by then that we'll be hesitant to say that Watson thinks. Now, we could, alternatively, insist that all cognitive systems run on the same uh, computational fundamentals, if you like. And maybe one day science will recognize these fundamentals of cognition. That is to say, science will recognize that, um, you know, the, the architecture of cognition, the simple parts uh, out of which cognitive systems are built, are the same, whether we're talking about uh, the mind-brain or a computer program. But of course, that raises another question. If we uh, say that there might be some kind of computational substructure common to humans and computers, how will we know when we found it? In other words, what kind of computational substructure is required before we can justifiably say that some physical system, be it a, a computer or a brain, thinks? And how would we know when something is implementing such a substructure? Well, Perhaps we could look at a specific type of behavior. Perhaps we could look at the behavior of the systems in question, uh, that is, the system's responses to, quote, a broad and flexible range of responses to a multiplicity of environmental demands and situations. I'm quoted just now from Clark on page 21. Now, the examples that we've considered so far seem to fail here, too. Deep Blue can play chess better than any human chess player. Indeed, uh, the chess programs that you can get on your laptop computer are probably better than human players. Uh, I believe Magnus Carlsen is currently the highest rated chess player, and he would probably be beaten in a chess tournament by um, a top-of-the-line chess playing program. No doubt about it. My money would be on the AI there any day. However, Deep Blue or any other advanced chess algorithm can only play chess. It can't make a pizza. It can't raise a child. It can't write a poem, right? So um, these machines, whether we're talking about Eliza, Perry, Alice, Jabberwacky, Deep Blue, or Watson, they cannot respond to, quote, a broad and flexible range of um, environmental demands and situations in the way that we can. They do not ex uh, express what Newell and Simon called general intelligent action. But let's say we decide to look at behavior. Even though all of these different systems seem to fail to pass this behavior test, what kind of test could we use? Um, and what kind of worries would such a test carry with it? Well, of course, the uh, go-to example here is the imitation game, more popularly known as the Turing test. And the Turing test was conceived of by computer scientist Alan Turing as a sort of operationalist test of machine intelligence. 
Basically, the Turing test would go like this. A human is talking to another agent. We call the human who's asking the questions the interrogator. And she's talking to another agent, which could be another human, or it could be a computer program. Now, if after a certain length of time, putting questions to the machine or the human, that the interrogator is not able to tell whether she is talking to a computer program or another person, then we could say that that agent passes the Turing test. So if our interrogator is talking to a computer, say via teletype written messages, and she cannot tell whether she's conversing with a machine or a human, that machine passes the test. And according to Turing, we're justified in saying that the machine thinks. Now some have worried, uh, myself included, that perhaps Turing's test doesn't allow a sufficient distinction between mere mimicry or imitation and genuine thought. I mean, after all, it was initially called the imitation game, not the genuine thinking game. Now, there are some who worry that uh, Turing's test doesn't allow for a sufficient distinction between mere mimicry and uh, genuine thought, right? Steve Wozniak, for example, uh, of Apple computer fame, has proposed more... Um, uh, I guess, embodied versions of the test to solve for this. You know, design a robot and see if it can go to a restaurant and order a hamburger or a coffee or something. That seems to certainly involve a good bit more intelligence, or at least the kind of intelligence that we display in the real world. Uh, Stephen Harnad has also conceived of the total Turing test, where the machine doesn't just have to pass the test uh, by virtue of having sufficiently complex verbal behavior, it also has to be uh, physically indistinguishable from a human, and it has to be able to behave physically like a human. So here we're talking about a kind of robotic version of the Turing test, where we would have a, a computer in a robot body, um, and we'd have to see if that body could behave uh, as well as speak to us like a human would in a convincing human-like way. And of course, Turing himself uh, discusses some of these concerns in his own paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, which I will make available on See You Learn, I think, in case anyone wants to take a look. I may also make available some other supplemental readings, so uh, these will not be required, but if you want to take a look, I encourage you to do so. So, all of this is to say that it is not yet clear whether surface behaviors, you know, the behaviors that we observe, uh, can really help us distinguish between mere mimicry and genuine thinking, whether the computational system is just a cheap imitation or whether it's actually carrying out some kind of, you know, computational process that we could legitimately describe as intelligent. This is not clear yet. But I think, along with Clark, that perhaps it is best to let behavioral profiles lead the way. That is to say, Tests like the Turing test are not, um, are not open and shut. And even, you know, I've even mentioned examples where we could say perhaps that, you know, early, early computer programs like ELIZA seem to have passed the Turing test. They would not pass it now. And indeed, as discussed in one of the boxes in this chapter, um, that we have things like the Bot Prize, the Lubner Prize. Uh, we have these competitions where... Um, people can enter their computer programs to see if they can pass a version of the Turing test, but they're never really that impressive. And years after um, the test has been passed and AI has advanced, we tend to come back and look at the AI of the past uh, as something that's not really as intelligent as, as it seemed when we, first, um, when we first interacted with it, right? Or when we were first made aware of it. So uh, I think it's best to let these behavioral profiles guide the way. That's what Clark thinks as well. But we need to do so with uh, caution, if you like. Anyway, so much for discussion point C, mimicking, modeling, and behavior. Let us now turn to the final point of discussion. Consciousness, information, and pizza. So far, we've been confining our discussion to, you know, intelligence. But what about consciousness? That's the really interesting thing here for many people. How could a machine, or a physical system if you like, 
made of metal and silicon, or for that matter, made of uh, neurons and gray matter and white matter and, and all of that stuff. How could either of these be conscious, right? That's really what the two alien observers are racking their brains over in They're Made Out of Meat. How do they think with their meat? How strange. How is this possible? Now perhaps, as it is with computation, maybe what matters is not uh, what something is made of. So that is not only for thinking, but also for consciousness. Maybe what is not important is the physical stuff that the machine is made out of, so much as how it is functionally organized. And here you might want to recall the ideas of multiple realizability and machine functionalism. However, it could turn out that conscious awareness depends more upon the stuff itself and its properties rather than how the physical stuff is organized. Now, of course, we have to be careful here. Um, terms like conscious awareness or conscious experience or just consciousness are ambiguous because they cover so many different phenomena, right? I mean, some thinkers use terms like consciousness to refer to quite high-level capacities. Uh, perhaps metacognitive capacities, like our ability to think about our own thoughts or think about our own feelings. So metacognition is thinking about thinking, not merely thinking. Some people mean something like that. Others simply mean something like the difference between being awake and being asleep. If you're awake, you're conscious, and if you're asleep, you're unconscious, right? So there's many different ways that these terms are thrown around. For us, the relevant meaning or the relevant sense of the word consciousness or related terms like conscious awareness or conscious experience is that there is something that it's like to be conscious. That is, uh, this, you know, as Ned Block says, uh, this is what he calls phenomenal consciousness. Uh, there's a what it's likeness to being consciousness. There's something that it's like to sit here and talk to you via this uh, lecture. There's something that it's like to take a sip of coffee. Mmm. So for us, uh, you know, consciousness just means that there is some kind of qualitative, phenomenal, first-person subjective experience there. That's what consciousness is for our purposes. You can think, for example, here, if you like, of the difference between uh, some electronic sensors that can detect explosives uh, which Clark mentions in, this book, in his book, certain electronic detectors can detect the presence, uh, or sorry, detect the presence of plastic explosives, for example, the same way a bomb-sniffing dog would. But there's nothing that it's like to be an electronic explosives detector, as far as we know. But there is something that it is like, probably, to be the bomb-sniffing dog. The bomb-sniffing dog has qualia. All right, qualia are these ineffable, qualitative um, features of our experience, like the bitterness of coffee, um, or the, the redness of a rose, or something like that, right? A singular quail, plural qualia. Incidentally, John Searle, who I mentioned in the last lecture, thinks that this is exactly where computationalism breaks down. But we're not going to get into that in too much detail now. Rather, we're going to talk about that in chapter two. So that'll be our fourth, our, our third and fourth lectures, our lectures for next week. I don't want to get too deep into these philosophical quandaries, but you should keep a couple of things in mind uh, as you read about this stuff in this text throughout the rest of the course. One thing to keep in mind is that simulation is not instantiation. And this is very much along the lines of what we talked about in the previous point of discussion, right? A simulation, a computer model of a schizophrenic patient like Perry, has no qualia. There's nothing that it's like to be Perry. Not only does Perry not know or understand anything that it does in the way that we know and understand what we do, Perry doesn't have any inner experience. Uh, Perry is just software. But of course, another thing to keep in mind is that many feelings uh, that we experience, I'm talking not just emotions, but somatic states, have a biological basis. That is a chemical or a hormonal basis in the body. And it's possible that these kinds of things will be re resistant 
to reproduction in electronic media, that is in, you know, electronic digital computers, for example. Now, these two worries are intuitively appealing to some, uh, especially figures like John Searle, right? However, they are not knockdown arguments against physicalism slash materialism or against computationalism or functionalism. And that's because whether these worries turn out to be legitimate or not will depend on what kind of phenomenon that consciousness actually turns out to be. So there are skeptics about computationalism, like John Searle, who says that, you know, syntax is not semantics. Uh, a machine uh, that is, uh, that respects semantics, that preserves meaning, but that is nonetheless blind to the semantics and only operates on the syntactic properties of the structures within the system, will never be intelligent. We can never justifiably say that it thinks. Uh, because it will just not have any understanding of what it's doing. And we're going to get into this in more detail in Chapter 2 when we talk about physical symbol systems and the Chinese room thought experiment. But for now, suffice to say that skeptics like John Searle say that information processing, you know, the right kind of computation that we talked about earlier, is not sufficient for conscious experience. Perhaps it's necessary in some way, but it's not sufficient. So here, somebody like Searle, uh, or another skeptic about computationalism's ability to explain consciousness, might say that even if the computational or functional description of a system is complete, it lacks all of the hormones and synapses that we find in real brains. So even if I um, at, you know, create a computational system that accurately mirrors the computational system of the mind brain, it doesn't have, you know, real physical stuff that it might need, like these neurotransmitters. You know, neurotransmitters are a kind of chemical uh, that, that we find in the brain. Synapses are connections between neurons. We don't have all that stuff. We don't have in a computer the causal powers, that's what Searle would cause them, that brains have. So that's one of the worries that these skeptics about computationalism have. So even if the system behaves like us, you know, say I build a robot uh, that uh, it's, it's artificial, it's, it's not biological, it's got silicon circuits and microchips and wires, and um, I, I've got a, a great implementation of all the computational details of, of the human brain, but it doesn't have any of the biological stuff with the necessary causal powers for consciousness. So it's all dark on the inside. Basically, my robot is a philosophical zombie. Indeed, um, John Searle actually presents a chilling scenario, which I think they may have also used in an episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Uh, I don't know the episode, um, but uh, basically the scenario goes as follows. Your brain is gradually replaced with artificial implants, right? Perhaps you have some kind of degenerative brain disorder, right? Um, so we replace the defective parts of your brain with these artificial implants. And Searle imagines that as this is done, your behavior remains the same, but your conscious experience actually shrinks. Uh, you end up, after your entire brain has been replaced, as a philosophical zombie, as something that physically is identical to you and behaviorally identical to you, but that has no conscious experience. That is what a philosophical zombie is. It's quite a chilling scenario. But of course, others disagree. Daniel Dennett, um, in his book Consciousness Explained, has argued very compellingly that we are a kind of zombie, but we're a kind of self-monitoring zombie. And through this self-monitoring of our zombie mind brain, that's one way to explain conscious experience. But we don't have time to get into the details of that right now. Now, of course, all of this, whether this skepticism about computationalism is warranted, again, depends on what the role of the biological stuff is, and in turn, what kind of phenomenon that consciousness is. Does the wetware of the brain affect information that flows through the system, and only affect information that flows through the system? If that's what's going on, if all of these hormones and chemicals and neurotransmitters are just kind of like 
modulators in this big information processing system that is the brain, then perhaps we could realize it or implement it in some other medium. Perhaps we could have virtual neurotransmitters in an electronic computer, for example. Perhaps mind-altering drugs for a robot would be like software packages that you have to download into your robot brain. Um, just like how mind-altering drugs in humans are chemicals that are similar enough to endogenous chemicals in the brain that they affect the way information flows through the wetware in our heads. So that is one possibility, that it's not the, the, it's not the causal powers of the stuff, it's the functional role of the physical stuff in our brains. It's not that we have uh, specifically dopamine and serotonin and norepinephrine, but it's the information processing regulation roles that these chemicals play that is important. And if that is what explains conscious experience, well, then we might be able to implement it in another system, an artificial system like a computer or a robot, for example. Alternatively, however, it could turn out that conscious experience is not an informational phenomenon. All of the stuff I just described would mean that conscious experience is an informational phenomenon because it would rely in some way on the information processing in the system in question. But if that's not the case, it may be the case that consciousness depends on an as yet undiscovered property of the physical stuff that brains are made of. Gray matter, white matter, uh, different kinds of neurotransmitters, things like this, right? It could be that they have some undiscovered causal powers or causal properties and that is what explains consciousness. This is something that the philosopher David Chalmers argues for. And sometimes we call this property dualism. Property dualism is not exactly like uh, substance dualism or methodological dualism. Property dualism just says that, well, there are perhaps physical properties to matter, but perhaps there are also mental properties to matter. Although this, on the face of it, doesn't seem as uh, far out as substance dualism, it does raise some issues related to what we call panpsychism. Uh, again, I don't have time to get into panpsychism right now, but if you have any questions about what this is, let me know in the comments section. So if you want, um, you can think of it like this to try and make things more concrete. This is following an example that uh, Clark offers in the end of chapter one in his book. Your lunch order, say you decide to order a pizza for lunch. Your lunch order is an informational phenomenon. You can send it over uh, a website or an app. You can call it in. It's informational. But um, when you get a pizza, the pizza is not an informational phenomenon, right? The pizza is just the pizza. You could, if you wanted, order a pizza on the internet pizza server, but you'd receive a delicious looking image of a pizza on a website and not an actual pizza. And uh, this is the kind of thing that um, thinkers like Chalmers and Searle are a little concerned about, and to a certain extent Clark as well, although I don't think Clark goes, uh, goes into this kind of property dualism stuff. Clark is much more of an extended mind guy, but in any case, somebody like Searle is worrying that computationalism, or at least the picture of, uh, of, of the mind that we get from computationalism, is a bit like ordering a pizza on the internet pizza server and not receiving a real pizza, just a picture of a pizza. Uh, Searle doesn't think, think that pizzas are informational, like our internet server pizza is. Pizzas are real pizzas. Uh, our order for a pizza, as I mentioned before, is informational, but we don't want an informational pizza. We want the actual pizza. Searle does not think that the actual pizza is informational, the actual pizza being conscious experience. In other words, what the pizza is made of matters for somebody like Searle or Chalmers. We can't make a pizza out of ones and zeros, just, can't, just like we can't make a conscious thinking system out of ones and zeros. We need materials with the right causal powers, brains. Just like to make a pizza, we need the right materials, dough, cheese, sauce, toppings, etc. So to sum all of this up, if consciousness is an informational phenomenon, then a computational account 
Like, for example, the sort of thing that Jerry Fodor or Zenon Polition offers might explain consciousness. But if consciousness is not an informational phenomenon, if it depends on the physical properties of the matter that makes up the system that is conscious, then maybe you need a different kind of account to explain consciousness. We might need a property dualist account, a bit like Chalmers or Searle's account to explain consciousness. But of course, we're not going to be able to answer this question in this class. But who knows? Um, maybe one day in the future, one of you will help to answer this question. That's why you're in this class, after all, right? So to sum all of this up, if consciousness is an informational phenomenon, then a computational account, like, for example, the sort of thing that Jerry Fodor or Zenon Polition offers, might explain consciousness. But if consciousness is not an informational phenomenon, if it depends on the physical properties of the matter that makes up the system that is conscious, then maybe you need a different kind of account to explain consciousness. We might need a property dualist account, a bit like Chalmers or Searle's account to explain consciousness. But of course, we're not going to be able to answer this question in this class. But who knows? Um, maybe one day in the future, one of you will help to answer this question. That's why you're in this class, after all, right? All right, everyone, so that is everything for today. We have finished chapter one. We started last time by talking about chapter 1.1 and 1.3, and of course today we filled in the gap by looking at the points of discussion from chapter 1.2. Those points of discussion were, why do we treat thought as computation? Is software an autonomous level in nature? Mimicking modeling behavior? And consciousness information and pizza. Of course, we've seen why we treat thought as computation, it works, although it's questionable whether we can treat consciousness as, a as the result of computation yet. Is software an autonomous level in nature? No, we make these distinctions, and we need to keep that in mind as we study intelligent and or conscious systems. Mimicking modeling and behavior. It's probably okay to let behavior guide the way, but again, we need to be careful. And all of this gives us a pretty good uh, reason, a good impetus, um, for constantly trying to work out what we mean by words like consciousness, intelligence, and thinking, and thought, and so on and so forth. These are discussions that need to keep happening in the cognitive sciences, and that's why philosophers of cognitive science uh, do the work that they do today. And finally, consciousness and information and pizza. Can we explain consciousness computationally like we explain thinking computationally? Maybe. It depends on whether consciousness turns out to be an informational phenomenon or a phenomenon that has something to do with the physical properties of the stuff that makes up the conscious system, right? Okay, so that's all we talked about for this week. Next week, we're going to begin Chapter 2, which is entitled Symbol Systems. We're going to be looking at a specific version of uh, computationalism called the Physical Symbol System Hypothesis, and we'll start looking at replies to it, like John Searle's Chinese Room argument. But that's all for now. I hope you're all doing well. I hope you are all following the material without uh, any serious issues so far. However, I'd just like to remind you that you're welcome to reach out to me at any time via email, YouTube comment section, or Discord. I will endeavor to answer your questions as best I can. Otherwise, I will see you all next Tuesday for our next lecture. Bye for now, everybody.